For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? So Jesus today is asking us to consider who is within our circle of love and who is outside of it. So for most of us, it would be very common. There are certain people we don't love. Maybe we're not interested in them. Maybe they offend us. Maybe some of their beliefs are different than our beliefs. So today is the final homily of our four-part uh, series on life and abortion. And we're just going to meditate on three groups of people that we might not love well. And as the uh, pre-mask reader said, um, in about 10 minutes, we'll show the images of abortion. So I'll give you another uh, warning just before then, just so it doesn't catch any parents by surprise. So the first group of people that might be outside of our, our love, who would it be? Do you know who it is? I think it's people who call themselves pro-choice. And I have to admit, and I'm not happy to admit it, but it's good to admit it, this really applies to me in the sense that I don't love them the way Jesus does. That's not good. Now, I can give you all sorts of excuses why I find people who call themselves pro-choice. I can tell you why I think they're frustrating. That's not the real issue. The real issue is me. I don't love the way Jesus does. When Jesus teaches today, if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them also the second mile. He's talking here about patience. So according to uh, Jewish oral law, if someone hit you on the right cheek, your right cheek, and it's my right hand, it's going to be backhanded, right? And according to Jewish oral law, that required double the restitution normal. And Jesus is saying here, just wave that wave that right to restitution. And the one mile, that refers to a Roman soldier's privilege. If he insists that you carry his equipment for one mile, Jesus is saying, be generous. Carry that equipment even the second mile. I see this generosity and patience in my friend Stephanie Gray in her book on life and abortion. She tells all these stories about all these people who are mad at her, and she really loves them. They're always hostile, and she's so patient. She keeps on asking them questions. She really wants them to know that she loves them. And she quotes uh, Martin Luther King, who says, Whom you would change, you must first love, and they must know that you love them. Who you, whom you would change, you must first love, and they must know that you love them. Okay, so that's the first group of people. The second group of people that might be beyond our circle of love, who would it be? It would be people who are pro-life. Now, this applies for those of us who consider ourselves more pro-choice. So if you get frustrated with us who are pro-life, you might see us as judgmental, condemnatory, Maybe some of us have acted really poorly in the past. Maybe we sometimes act like we think we're better or holier. Maybe you've seen some of us show no compassion. Now look, obviously it's our, it's our responsibility to commit none of these sins. But if you do consider yourself more pro-choice, please think about how Jesus' words apply to you. Please do not condemn us pro-lifers unfairly. Please be patient with us. Jesus says, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. And the third group of people that we might not love, probably the biggest group, is, is the preborn. So most of the world doesn't really love them. They don't have any ability to defend or speak for themselves. And according to Wikipedia, in 2020, the whole year in Canada, there were 74,000 abortions. They are the least loved in our country. And we know that number is actually higher because there's no federal body that's um, entrusted to take care of all the statistics. It doesn't include like the abortion pill, like RU486. And it doesn't include like group clinics like Planned Parenthood. They don't have to report their numbers. So we know that number would be higher. As we've shown every year, here are the statistics of the leading causes of death in the world. Uh, so this is for 2023 thus far. 
And this is according to uh, worldometers.info. So it's a secular site. They just track statistics worldwide. So again, if you can just look through those on your own very briefly, what are the leading causes of death around the world? And because abortion is by far the greatest cause of death in the world so far, and it is every year, this is why Catholics make the argument, this is the number one moral issue, again, by far. Jesus says, be perfect therefore as your heavenly Father is perfect. So we're supposed to aim for perfection. Now sometimes we Catholics would say something like, well, I won't have an abortion, but I'm not going to tell anyone else what to do. Okay, so that's problematic on a number of, um, in a number of ways, but it's very minimalistic. I'm not going to do it, but I'm not going to tell. Jesus calls us to perfection, to do our absolute best to help people, to help people live a full life and not commit any, any sins. And this is why for the past two years, we've shown the images of abortion and we're going to do it again today because it's not enough to say it's wrong just to give statistics. We actually have to say, okay, what does pro-choice mean? What is the reality? So in about two minutes, we'll show these images. Now, if you just came by today, sorry for catching you off guard. Um, this is again, something we've done for the past two years. We've talked about it for the past two weeks. But the most shocking thing is not the images. The shocking thing is that this happens in our country. Like this is permitted by law. It's encouraged. Our whole society says, you can do it. There's nothing wrong with it. They encourage it. That's the really shocking part. We've also learned from experience, these images do change hearts. The argument goes from abstraction to reality. And this is why a lot of people who are pro-abortion, they don't like seeing these images. They know it really discredits the whole thing. So today, what we're going to do is we're just going to show one video and then three pictures in succession. It's going to last about four minutes. And the first video is basically the exact same dialogue or the monologue we heard last for the past two years. Exact same description, but this time it's got animation and it's horrible. And this stuff actually happens in our country. Now, people will sometimes say it's just a clump of cells. If it's just a clump of cells, no one would mind what we're going to see. And sometimes um, what actually happens, no one will ever say that a, a second trimester or first trimester baby doesn't look like that. They don't say that. They don't say, hey, a D&E abortion, that doesn't happen like that. It's completely different. They never say that because this is the way it happens. And at the end of the video, there will just be three uh, still photographs of first trimester abortions. And these are taken because the doctors, they have to remove all the parts of the baby from the uterus. Okay, so again, parents, if you don't want your children to see this, just have them look down. And if you, of course, you too, if you don't want to see it. And so here we go. My name is Dr. Kathy Altman. I'm a board-certified obstetrician-gynecologist with almost 33 years of experience, and I've completed over 500 abortions. Today I'm going to describe a second trimester surgical abortion called dilation and evacuation, or d and &E. A d and &E is generally performed between 14 and 22 weeks of pregnancy. Before a d and &E abortion can be done, the cervix must be dilated slowly over one to two days with laminaria or a similar product. Laminaria is a type of seaweed that absorbs water and swells to several times its original diameter. When the woman undergoes the evacuation portion of the procedure, she lies on a table with her legs in stirrups. She may be given injections of local anesthetic in the cervix, IV conscious sedation, or general anesthesia. The abortionist uses a speculum to open the vagina and uses an instrument to stabilize the cervix. Metal dilators may be used to further open the cervix if needed. Once the cervix has been stretched open, a cannula attached to suction tubing is placed inside the uterus. The suction machine is then turned on and the amniotic fluid surrounding the fetus is suctioned out. The fetus is too large to fit through the cannula, so he or she must be removed in pieces with a clamp such as this sofa clamp. 
A sofa clamp is made of stainless steel and is about 13 inches long. At the tip, there are rows of teeth for grasping. The abortionist reaches into the uterus with the clamp and tries to grasp an arm or leg. Once the abortionist has a firm grip, she pulls forcefully in order to remove the limb. Piece by piece, the abortionist removes the arms and legs, followed by the head or the body, including the torso and pelvis, along with the intestines, the heart, and the lungs. The placenta is also removed. If the cervix has been overdilated, the body or even the entire fetus may be pulled out intact. Any remaining limbs, organs, bone fragments, or pieces of placenta not removed with the forceps are removed by scraping the uterine lining with a large curette or by reinserting the suction cannula. The abortionist then reassembles the fetal parts to make sure that there is nothing left inside the uterus which could cause infection or bleeding. Once all the parts have been accounted for, the bleeding has been controlled, and all the instruments have been removed from the vagina, the abortion is considered complete. For the woman, this procedure carries the risk of major complications, including perforation or laceration of the uterus or cervix, with possible damage to bowel, bladder, or other maternal organs. Infection and hemorrhage can also occur, which can lead to death. Future pregnancies are also at an increased risk for loss or premature delivery due to abortion-related physical trauma and injury to the cervix. As I mentioned at the beginning, I used to perform abortions. At the time, I truly believed I was helping women. After the birth of my daughter, however, I realized that abortion doesn't just end a pregnancy. It kills an innocent human being. Such terms as zygote, embryo, or fetus are simply terms that refer to age, like infant, toddler, and adult, and do nothing to diminish the humanity of the child. As I cared for women in my OBGYN practice, I also learned how abortion harms women. I stopped doing abortions because I could no longer kill babies just because they were unwanted. I am now a pro-life advocate. I am proof that anyone can change, no matter who they are or what they've done. I invite you to join me and make a decision to protect the preborn. Thank you for watching. Okay. So it is horrible, this happens in our country, it's permitted by law and it's encouraged. And we thank God that he will forgive all the sins of abortion because he's so good and he loves us so much. And we always have to remember that. God will forgive every sin because he loves us. But we should be angry that this happens in our country. We should let our anger motivate us towards action. So we've got our 40 Days for Life uh, prayer vigil. This is what we've been inviting everyone to do for the past uh, three weeks. So today is our last opportunity to sign up. So if you're sitting at the edges of your pews, could you please, for the final time, thank you, hand out those cards. You're sitting on them at the end. If you can just pass them to the people next to you so that they have a chance to sign up. So we're going to be starting this Thursday. It's going um, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Whatever you can do, uh, we really appreciate it. And to the 113 of you who have already signed up, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So uh, inspiring. A number of you are taking multiple shifts. Thank you so much. What you see now on your screen is uh, uh, in yellow are the empty spaces. So sometimes, obviously, depending on people's schedules, we might all show up at the same time. If you're able to show up at those empty spaces, that'd be great. And once you let us know, we'll make sure that you are not alone. We'll never leave anyone alone. And you can just consider that. You're all, they're also in your pews. And if you fill it out, you can put in the collection uh, basket when it comes around or at the back of the church. So once again, everyone, thank you for your love and your courage. May we all aim to be like our Heavenly Father who makes his love come upon all people.